Recently, I asked the students in my prose style class to think of memorable first sentences from novels. The results were actually a little disappointing, as almost everyone in the class came up with the same two or three first sentences, but only a couple of students could think of more than that. Of course, Call Me Ishmael made almost everyone's list. This is the saddest story I have ever heard, the very revealing sentence with which John Dowell opens Ford Maddox Ford's The Good Soldier popped up on several lists. As Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed into a giant insect. That was mentioned by a student who was also taking my modern fiction class in which we were then studying the metamorphosis. Another student remembered most of the words to Tolstoy's happy families are all alike, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And that was pretty much it. To my surprise, no one mentioned, last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again. No one mentioned it was a bright, cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. No one mentioned, I am an invisible man. And no one remembered the telling first line of Slaughterhouse-Five. All this happened, more or less. And no one mentioned the tone-setting, cyberpunk-launching first sentence from William Gibson's Neuromancer. The sky above the port was the color of television tuned to a dead channel. Not surprisingly, the one opening line everyone in the class remembered was, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. That supremely balanced sentence that begins a tale of two cities. Dickens made that opening so memorable by exploiting in just a few words almost all the strategies of syntactic balance. It was the before the comma is mirrored by it was the after the comma. And the fact that each clause starts with the same words exploits the classical rhetorical trope of anaphora. The first clause ends with times, as does the second clause, exploiting the classical rhetorical trope of epistrophe. And that both first and last words of these two clauses are the same makes it an, exa make it, makes it an example of yet another rhetorical trope, simplicity. The only difference between the first clause and the second is that the word best before the comma is changed to worst after the comma creating a simple but effective antithesis. In fact, it's hard to imagine a more perfectly balanced sentence. Only what my students did not remember is that it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, is not the first sentence of A Tale of Two Cities, but is instead only the first of a string of balanced clauses and conceptual balances that combine to form a first sentence that keeps on going for some 118 words. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. And Dickens doesn't stop there, following this superbly balanced long sentence with even more balances. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a plain face on the throne of England. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a fair face on the throne of France. In both countries, it was clearer than crystal to the lords of the state preserves of loaves and fishes that things in general were settled forever. Dickens balances the English king with a large jaw against the French king with a large jaw. The English queen with a plain face against the French queen with a fair face. The throne of England against the throne of France. Then, in the next sentence, he exploits the duple rhythm of clearer than crystal 
and the pairing of loaves and fishes and creates a subtle parallel between the three-word phrase, things in general, and the three-word phrase, settled forever. One can almost imagine Dickens performing these sentences, emphasizing their on the one hand, on the other hand, structure with the regularity of a metronome, this, that, this, that, this, that. What makes this famous opening of Dickens's novel so memorable is variously referred to as its balanced form or its extended parallelism. These two concepts exist in a kind of chicken and egg relationship, either balances the heart of parallelism or parallelism is the heart of balance. It is easy to specify what makes a formally balanced sentence. A balanced sentence hinges in the middle, usually split by a semicolon, the second half of the sentence paralleling the first half, but changing one or two key words or altering word order. Dickens's first sentence in A Tale of Two Cities doesn't exactly fit the bill for a formally balanced sentence but each of its seven initial paired clauses could, reminding us that sometimes a comma does the work of a semicolon in these constructions. But while this sentence strings together a sequence of parallel balances, there are so many of them that we become more focused on the sentence's parallels than on each of its binary oppositions. Edward Everett Hale, Jr., descendant of American patriot Nathan Hale, and son of the famous orator and author of the short story, The Man Without a Country, drew this distinction between balance and parallelism in his Constructive Rhetoric, published in 1896. Offering as an example of balance the sentence, his ambition impelled him in one direction, but his diffidence dragged him in the other, Hale explained, in its arrangement of clauses, balance resembles parallel construction. But parallel construction usually arranges several clauses as if side by side, connected by the punctuation, while a balance, as it were, hangs to clauses one on each side of a conjunction or its equivalent. His enthusiasm for balance obviously waning, Hale continues, the reason why the balanced sentence was selected from a great number of typical sentence structures was, I take it, that it had been a favorite with the writers of the 18th century and that it was used with excellent effect by Macaulay. In itself, the balanced sentence has its advantages, but in spite of them all, it is not much used at the present. Hale's view, however, may have been more accurate in 1896 than it would be today. Since the intervening years have seen Winston Churchill, John F. Kennedy, and even Barry Goldwater reintroduce balance to public discourse to considerable effect, few of us will ever forget JFK's Ask Not What Your Country Can Do For You line in his inaugural address. And while it did not lead to his inauguration, Barry Goldwater's extremism in, defense, in the defense of liberty is no vice, moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue, is also well remembered, if somewhat balefully. Writing specifically about Samuel Johnson, W.K. Wimsatt Jr. offers a further distinction between balance and parallelism. Wimsatt refers to Johnson's, quote, parallelism of meaning, end quote, as opposed to his, quote, parallelism of sound, end quote suggesting that critics who refer to Johnson's balance are actually more aware of the latter kind of parallelism than of the former. He adds that references to cadence and a rhythm generally have more to do with balance than with parallelism, and concludes that, quote, we may begin to form an opinion of Johnson's parallelism when we consider that of sound as auxiliary to and made significant by that of meaning, end quote. I mention these distinctions only to, dis, uh, to establish that while some discussions treat parallelism and balance as the same thing, others insist that these terms refer to distinct phenomena. Most writing texts today focus on parallelism, balance having apparently fallen out of favor as too arbitrary or too artificial a writing trope. Its masters, John Lilly and Samuel Johnson, 
having also fallen a bit out of favor for prose styles that forced all experience into neatly ordered binary structures. We get a pretty good idea of this technique in Dr. Johnson's celebrated pronouncement in The Rambler. We are all prompted by the same motives, all deceived by the same fallacies, all animated by hope, obstructed by danger, entangled by desire, and seduced by pleasure. I'll talk more about both Lilly and Dr. Johnson in a moment, but first I want to sketch out the way I present these two important syntaxes or rhythms in my writing classes, where I tell my students that parallelism is the foundation that underlies both the double beats of balance and the three-part rhythms of serial construction. The writing structures that present the world in terms of dividing it into twos and threes fascinate me, since double and triple rhythms are really the only rhythms the writer of prose can consistently employ to any significant effect. So I see parallelism as the building blocks from which we construct both crucial rhythms. And parallelism has already been prominently featured in this series of lectures, even if I have not specifically called attention to it. Parallelism largely accounts for the ebb and flow rhythm of the cumulative sentence. Some coordinate cumulative sentences foreground parallelism, as we can see in a sentence such as, The movie was a terrible disappointment. Its plot ridiculous, its dialogue insulting, its acting amateurish, and even its cinematography substandard. Or, this was the moment he had been so eagerly awaiting, the moment when he could step out from under the shadow of his more famous brother, the moment when he could finally show the world his own talent, the moment when all of his planning and preparation would finally pay off. Or, in Ulysses, James Joyce may have written the first novel with a soundtrack, song lyrics continuously running through the thoughts of Leopold Bloom, actual songs frequently being heard by Bloom as he makes it through the day, the musical form of the fugue actually accounting for the odd structure of the Sirens chapter. Indeed, parallelism contributes to the power of the cumulative syntax even when the parallels are less obvious, as when the final word or phrase of a base clause is matched by starting the next modifying level with a similar kind of word adjective leading to adjective, adverb to adverb, noun to noun. For example, his coat was tattered, frayed from daily wear. Or, I returned to my studies with new dedication, concentration replacing my previous carelessness. Or, she wanted to be loved, to be respected. And, of course, the parallelism somewhat camouflaged in these examples is made unavoidably obvious if the final word of the base clause is simply repeated as the first word of the cumulative modifying phrase. His coat was tattered, tattered beyond all hope of repair. I return to my studies with new dedication, dedication that was eventually to result in my graduating with highest honors. She wanted to be loved, loved for all the reasons that were so clear to her. But these quite modest examples of parallelism and cumulative syntax can be heightened and extended to produce sentences with phrases as elaborately parallel as Thomas Berger is an American novelist whose career defies easy description. His 23 novels arguably representing 23 different novel forms. His subjects ranging from the Old West to Arthurian England to a robotic artificial woman his highly praised Reinhardt series featuring a single protagonist but following that protagonist's misadventures in four novels of distinctly different styles, his reputation well established as one of our best known and most celebrated neglected authors. Or even more so, as in, the concepts of metempsychosis and parallax account for almost all of the structure and style of Joyce's Ulysses. Metempsychosis, best described as reincarnation, providing both the tie to earlier narratives, such as the Odyssey, and the rationale for the way words and themes are continuously reborn in the text, popping up again and again. Parallax, best described as the alternation of point of view, 
providing both the explanation of Leopold Bloom's dominant characteristic and the rationale for the way Joyce's great novel shifts prose style from chapter to chapter, challenging us again and again to learn a new way to read. And, of course, parallelism also figures prominently in a number of the patterns that produce suspensive sentences. Any sentence that opens with a cascade of conditionals, whether if phrases, because phrases, even or when phrases, or which open with a string of infinitive phrases serving as an extended subject, will possibly display as much parallelism as suspensiveness. Indeed, while I'm not exactly sure what the analytical payoff for such an observation might be, it seems clear that parallelism, like suspensiveness, is always a matter of degree, ranging from the mi most minute parallels of syllable count and sound through parallels of length and parts of speech to conceptual parallels so broad or abstract as to initially escape our notice. To me, parallelism is the starting point for both powerful and playful prose. But most writing texts present parallelism in terms of rules of correctness as something we must get right, or certainly should never get wrong, as opposed to something we should celebrate. For example, Professor Strunk informed his writing students that they should, quote, express coordinate ideas in similar form, end of quote, explaining that the principle of parallel construction requires that expressions similar in content and function be outwardly similar. While Strunk cites the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, he cites this as an illustration of the virtue of parallel construction. He's actually more interested in having his students avoid the vice of failing to maintain proper parallelism. Even then, he seems reluctant to overpraise the form. When he notes that the sentence, quote, Formerly, science was taught by the textbook method, while now the laboratory method is employed, fails to maintain the parallelism reflected in the sentence, Formerly, science was taught by the textbook method, now it is taught by the laboratory method, he only makes the somewhat tepid claim that in the latter version, quote, the writer has at least made a choice and abided by it, end of quote. The majority of his discussion of parallelism is devoted to suggesting how to avoid failures of parallelism in the use of prepositions and correlatives such as both and, not only, but also, and so on. One can only wonder whether Professor Strunk's little-remembered earlier edition of Macaulay's and Carlyle's essays on Samuel Johnson had given him a fatal overdose of parallel and balanced constructions. In similar fashion, the Little Brown Essential Handbook, 5th edition, offers this restrained and somewhat redundant definition. Parallelism matches the form of your sentence to its meaning. When your ideas are equally important or parallel, you express them in similar or parallel grammatical form. And it offers the understated example, the air is dirtied by factories belching smoke and vehicles spewing exhaust. The only advantage for parallelism cited in the Little Brown Handbook is that, quote, it can work like glue to link the sentences of a paragraph as well as the parts of a sentence, end of quote. And it devotes equal attention to warning that computer grammar and style checkers cannot recognize faulty parallelism because they cannot recognize the relations among ideas. My trusty old Harbrace College Handbook, 7th edition, is slightly more enthusiastic about parallelism, citing linguist Simeon Potter's view that, quote, balanced sentences, note the interchangeability of terms I previously mentioned, balanced sentences satisfy a profound human desire for equipoise and symmetry, end of quote. But the handbook follows that provocative claim with only the pedestrian advice Use parallel form, especially with coordinating conjunctions, in order to express your ideas simply and logically. The Harbrace Handbook does go on to instruct that to create parallel structure, the writer should 
balance a word with a word, a phrase with a phrase, a clause with a clause, a sentence with a sentence, followed by examples of awkward failures of parallelism and their improved parallel versions, once again placing more emphasis on error avoidance than on the rhetorical benefits of parallelism. Washington Post copy desk chief Bill Walsh continues this practice in his book Lapsing into a Comma, a curmudgeon's guide to the many things that can go wrong in print and how to avoid them, where, true to his title, he offers the sentence, quote, there are reports that the boy was beaten, molested, and is now a drug addict as a classic non-parallel construction because its first verb, was beaten, is not parallel with its second verb, is now a drug addict, with molested ambiguously hanging between the two. Walsh only prescribes fixing this error either by placing the conjunction and before molested, the boy was beaten and molested, or repeating was before molested, the boy was beaten, was molested, and is now a drug addict with absolutely no consideration to reasons why parallelism might add value to prose style as well as to correct mistakes. The general tenor of these constructions of parallelism as something not to be gotten wrong is perfectly captured in W.K. Wimsatt's highly ironic praise, quote, the resourcefulness of student writers in obscuring and avoiding parallels is boundless." End of quote. I call attention to these discussions of parallelism because they are so restrained, while parallelism is so cool. At what point, I wonder, did this most memorable of rhetorical strategies fall on hard times? And if the broad concept of parallelism is now viewed in such restrained, if not cautionary terms, what of the more intense rhetorical protocols of balance? I'm glad to report that parallelism still has at least one effective champion in Virginia Tufty, who devotes a chapter to it in her artful sentences, Syntaxis style. Tufty prefaces her chapter on parallelism with a cheering quotation from Richard D. Altick. The matching of phrase against phrase, clause against clause, lends an unmistakable eloquence to prose. That indeed is one of the principal glories of the King James Bible, and to some extent, in reminiscence and imitation of the Bible, English prose all the way down to our time has tended toward balanced structure for the sake of contrast or antithesis or climax. Parallelism, Tufty quite reasonably explains, is saying like things in like ways. It is accomplished by repetition of words in syntactic structures in planned symmetrical arrangements and, if not overdone, has a place in day-to-day -day writing. Tufty acknowledges what most writing guidebooks fail to say, that deliberately faulty parallelism, the frustration of our expectation that a structure will be repeated, can sometimes be seen as a syntactic strength rather than a weakness or an error, offering as an example a sentence from John Steinbeck's Sweet Thursday. Here was himself, young, good-looking, snappy dresser and making dough. And she notes that the repetition called for to achieve parallelism can sometimes be understood through ellipsis, as in a sentence from Bradford Smith, for love is stronger than hate and peace than war. She presents balance as a subset of parallelism and offers an extended discussion of strategies which produce balance, a number of which I'll return to in the next lecture. For now, I simply want to applaud Virginia Tufty for her celebration of parallelism and balance, a celebration that has grown, has grown far too rare in contemporary considerations of writing style. Earlier, I wondered when parallelism and balance fell on hard times in the teaching of writing. And while I can't pinpoint a date for that, I think I can offer an explanation tied to and possibly stuck in history. The problem is that the great majority of examples of sustained parallelism and extended balance are taken in almost every writing guidebook from Samuel Johnson and John Lilly. 
Now, Lilly was a Renaissance writer, very successful in his time, who lived during the last 50 years of the 16th century and is best known for his Euphues, The Anatomy of Wit, and Euphues and, and his England, a second book published a couple of years later. Samuel Johnson, who has achieved celebrity, who has achieved celebrity single name status as Dr. Johnson, lived in and wrote across much of the 18th century, and while he authored a prodigious number of works, he's perhaps best known for his A Dictionary of the English Language, published in 1755, and his three-volume Lives of the Most Eminent Poets, 1781. I'll turn to a discussion of the strengths and weaknesses of Dr. Johnson in my next lecture. For now, I'll close my brief discussion of balance and parallelism with a few words about Lilly. I'll admit... A little lily goes a long way. Here's a brief excerpt from his dedication of Euphues to his patron, Sir William West. Lily is making the case for the essential honesty of his depiction of the youth Euphues. Whereby I gather that in all perfect works, as well the fault as the face is to be shown. The fairest leopard is set down with his spots, the sweetest rose with his prickles, the finest velvet with his brack. Seeing then that in every counterfeit as well the blemish as the beauty is colored, I hope I shall not incur the displeasure of the wise in that in the discourse of Euphues I have as well touched the vanities of his love as the virtue of his life. If then the first sight of Euphues shall seem too light to be read of the wise or too foolish to be regarded of the learned, they ought not to impute it to the iniquity of the author, but to the necessity of the history. Or, in a selection from the novel itself that is even a bit more true to Lily's wording and spelling, True it is, Philotus, that he which toucheth the nettle tenderly is soon as stung, that the fly which playeth with the fire is singed in the flame, that he that dallieth with women is drawn to his woe, and as the adamant draweth the heavy iron, the harp, the fleet dolphin, so beauty allureth the chaste mind to live and the wisest wit to lust. The example whereof I would it were no less profitable than the experience to me is like to be perilous. The vine watered with wine is soon withered. The blossom in the fattest ground is quickly blasted. The goat, the fatter she is, the less fertile she is, Yea, man, the more witty he is, the less happy he is. Whew. So patterned and so mannered, paralleled and balanced, was the prose in Lily's Euphues that it has given us the rhetorical term Euphuism, terming Euphuism, the, uh, the rhetorical prose style per excellence. Richard Lanham explains in his A Hand List of Rhetorical Terms that it emphasizes the figures of words that create balance and makes frequent use of antithesis, paradox, repetitive patterns with single words, sound plays of various sorts, amplification of every kind, sententiae, and especially the unnatural natural history or simile from traditional natural history. Somewhat discouragingly, Lanham adds, Lily's style has been studied largely to be deplored. And yet, as Lanham also notes, Lilly's reputation has been to some extent rehabilitated in recent years by scholars who credit him with making some significant contributions to English prose. I call attention to what I freely admit is the excessive balance and parallelism in Lilly's writing, only to remind us that the extreme limit his prose represents does not have to discourage us from occasional excursions along the continuum of parallelism as long as we remember to stop short of the degrees of parallelism crafted by Lilly. The problem is that we have been discouraged by writing text after writing text from playing with balance and parallelism, and there are few contemporary and effective examples of these forms for us to follow. In the next lecture, however, I'll provide such an example in the wonderfully balanced prose of philosopher, essayist, and novelist William Gass one of our most exciting and rewarding masters of prose style.